What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonners. This is episode 99. So we're just one episode away from the magical 100th episode. Yay! Uh, so we're really motoring along. This is actually the fourth episode that I've dropped in four days. Of course, on Saturday, um, I dropped the Wall Rumble Worlds Collide prediction show. On Sunday, we dropped the Worlds Collide review show. Uh, on Monday, yesterday, we dropped the kind of live experience review from Heather and Chris, uh, otherwise known as the rapper Half Decent, who was on the Jericho Cruise. They gave us a, a full hour of highlights from their four or five days over on, on the uh, Norwegian Pearl and uh, all their exploits there. The rest as they met uh, being part of AW Dynamite, um, watching Fozzy on stage and all the tribute shows all the various uh, kind of people they bumped into at the bar and at the uh, the buffet table. And then today, uh, I've got a special guest with me uh, who I will be introducing very soon. We'll be, we're going to be talking about the Royal Rumble. So this is our, our special Royal Rumble review, episode 99. Um, but uh, the, the only plug I want to throw out to you before we start talking about uh, Royal Rumble, which was quite an interesting show, quite a good show, some really memorable highlights. Uh, one plug that I'm going to throw out to you, and that is to visit our website, Rest wrestlingwithjohners.com that's wrestlingwithjohners.com where you've got uh, links to all of our social media pages so you don't have to hear me spew out all of our social media links and handles at the beginning of every episode uh, but you've got buttons at the top of the page so you can click on and find us on Twitter Instagram Facebook you can email us and get in touch with us via our, our uh, email uh, address as well uh, you've also got at the top of the website uh, links to all of our archive of podcasts and we've got a section especially for all of our interviews as well so if you're into your wrestling interviews just click on the interviews tab at the top of the wrestling with Jonas, uh, website page and you'll be taken to all the interviews that we've done you've got links there to our merch um, and to our uh, articles and to our news stories and so much more so go and check it out that's wrestlingwithjohners.com and one other thing at the top of the, uh, the page you've got a special uh, PayPal donate button. So if you do enjoy listening to the Wrestling Madonna's podcast, you want to support uh, the brand and support uh, Wrestling Madonna's and everything I do, because uh, it takes a lot of lot of personal time, a lot of uh, effort and research and preparation time into everything I do in connection with the podcast before, during and after. Um, and uh, I love every second that I pour into uh, doing the Wrestling with Jonas podcast. But uh, to help support the podcast and potentially, uh, you know, it could go some way to buying us extra equipment or new equipment like a, a new microphone or a, head for, a headset, uh, whatever the money will go towards. But to any think will be much appreciated you could click on that paypal donate button and donate anything from one dollar to ten dollars or whatever you want and if you do donate i will give you a shout out on a future episode of the podcast and that's uh, wrestlingwithjohners.com uh as if i haven't said it enough already but uh, that leads us nicely to our special guest on episode 99 of this uh, Royal Rumble review and uh, longtime friend of the show, longtime podcast contributor, uh, Kieran Reed is back on the show. So, Kieran, good afternoon. How are you, sir? I'm good. Glad to be back. I'm fully recovered after having a few drinks of the Rumble. Yeah. We watched, ready to go. Awesome. So he's he's, yeah, he's seen the Royal Rumble twice over. Um, but uh, but but before we get into our Royal Rumble review, now you saw uh, the Royal Rumble kind of out with some friends, um, kind of watching it in in a, in, a, in, a, in an establishment in a pub, a public house. Uh, so uh, t tell us a little bit about your experience. And uh, you, you said you had it with a few drinks. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think uh, a lot of our listeners probably did the same. I know I did while I was watching it at home. Uh, but um, you tend to do this uh, for all the big WWE shows. You kind of turn it into a bit, bit of an occasion, bit of a uh, an event for yourself. But tell us about your your uh, first viewing of the Royal Rumble on Sunday evening, then, Kieran. So it was it was quite weird because there was someone there that I hadn't actually seen for nine years since I was at college. Mm. I walked up to the bar because he works there. And I didn't know he worked there. I walked up to the bar and he looked at me and I looked at him. We just went, Kieran, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so it was nice it was like a blast from the past it was nice to actually catch up with him uh it's always nice to go to those sorts of things because you're with fellow wrestling fans yeah uh they always do the quiz as well which me and ashley are still unbeaten in nice so yeah we won that again well we we tied with another team so it's technically still a win of course um of course. but no they do it for all the big shows they do it summer slam survive series rumble and mania and is and it up on a big screen, Kieran? Is it up on a big screen? Can so you they pull it. 
they put it on the big screen and they put it on all the side TVs as well. Sure. So if it was too loud for you and you wanted to go elsewhere, it was it, it's it's nice if you want it to be a little bit quieter. And but most people sit in the main bit, just have a chat about what they think so far. And it's nice because because I smoke. If I go out for a cigarette when they're hyping up the next match and stuff, it's nice to talk to other wrestlers about what they think is going to happen. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, oh, you guys, you just, you don't know. You just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure being in that sort of environment in a bar, watching it on the big screen with lots of other wrestling fans, it creates a really good, uh, good, uh, good vibe, a lot of excite, uh, excitement, um, a good atmosphere. And um, I'm sure we won't talk about uh, the big surprises and the big pops, but I'm sure when you did get them big moments on Sunday night, uh, the place went wild, I'm sure. It was it was insane, but we'll get into that when we get to it. But it, it it was nuts, absolutely cool. nuts. Cool, cool, cool. Right then, Kieran. So, um, Royal Rumble 2020. Um, it was hosted inside the Minute Maid Park, which is a big baseball stadium um, in Houston, Texas. Forty over forty thousand people were in there. It looked um, it looked pretty good. Look, looked the sort of atmosphere and the sort of place uh, that you'd want to go. Had that kind of big event feel, that big WrestleMania vibe. And I know last year, um, I'm pretty sure it's last year they they hosted the Royal Rumble in another baseball stadium. And that was another huge event. I think it was a good, you know, 40, 45,000 people there as well. So the Royal Rumble, I mean, outside of WrestleMania, I think the Royal Rumble is the second biggest event because they know they can get a good audience, a big audience. They tend to do the Summer Slams and the Survivor Series and all the smaller pay-per-views inside an arena. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to Royal Rumble, you're going to get uh, you're going to get a, a lot of interest, a lot of ticket buyers, a lot of people wanting to go and see this. So a, a baseball stadium, it has been for the last couple of years. They did have a couple of kickoff matches a couple of pre-show matches. I don't know if you uh, had the opportunity to catch the uh, the kickoff matches, Kieran. Yeah, it was free with BT Sports, so they showed that as well. So I've I've got everything. Awesome, awesome. But uh, the first match, to the best of my recollection, was Sheamus versus Shorty G. Uh, as much as I hate saying that name, but uh, that was a fairly entertaining match for what it was. I think the, the stadium was only half full at the time, but they really did put on a, a, a good effort. I think the match was announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lot of people suspected that they might drop down onto the pre-show, uh, but Sheamus managed to defeat Shorty G there. Um, and uh, with a bro kick, I understand. But Shorty G, uh, Chad Gable did put on on a, a really good fight it was a pretty tough contest uh Sheamus really did kind of batter Shorty G with his, his kind of stiff uh forearms to the clubbing blows to the chest uh but it was a good match uh the second kickoff match was Andrade versus Humberto Carrillo with Andrade putting his United States championship on the line and that was a win for Andrade so two fairly entertaining kickoff matches um any thoughts on those two matches Kieran that anything kind of jumped out at you anything that took your interest or was uh, was it fairly kind of predictable outcomes so both of those were predictable outcomes but I don't want to spoil anything for anyone but if you if you've seen Raw and all the reports recently about Andrade I'm kind of shocked because well, I'm not because they did something that would take Andrade out for a little while on Raw. So, I mean, he, he's been suspended for 30 days under the WWE's wellness policy, hasn't he? So we don't know. We can't speculate on what he may or may not have taken. Um, but obviously, he's violated one of their drug offences. I'm guessing. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's the report. He's he's violated one of the drug drug policies. Uh, yeah. I don't want to go too much into it, but he kind no. of gets beaten. And it's, it's a real shame because um, he was on a, a, a bit of a roll. He's recently become the United States Championship a champion. He had that fantastic ladder match against Rey Mysterio on Raw last Monday. Um, hopefully it won't derail um, his push going into WrestleMania because I'd really like to see him in a WrestleMania match. I think this will probably be his first WrestleMania this coming April um, in Tampa Bay. Um, but hopefully, I, I, I don't I don't know because I haven't seen Raw yet, but I'm assuming that they'll probably vacate the championship. Um, and if they do, hopefully he might be in the running for it leading into WrestleMania on April the 5th. But we'll have to keep our fingers crossed there because he was in the middle of a really good run. He was in the middle of a really good push and that looks uh, to have been taken away from him because of whatever violence um he has uh you know uh done basically and then we yeah. go into the royal rumble main show now the first match uh to kind of get us all ready for the evening was uh 
King Baron Corbin versus Roman Reigns. Now, it feels like we've seen this match 50,000 times, Kieran, to be honest with you. And, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what happened during the match, it was fairly predictable. This was billed as a, a Falls Count Anywhere match. Um, any kind of thoughts or expectations going into this match? Uh, were you excited for this one before it happened? Was there anything you were looking forward to? Or were you kind of thinking, let's get it over and let's move on to another match? But uh, what were your thoughts before this one happened? So I was discussing this with Ashley while we were waiting for the show to start. We were trying to work out the match order. So I was like, right, it, it's got to be Corbin and Roman to start because they're both in the Rumble. So they need a decent rest time. That was a given. Um, but then I was like, apart from that, I couldn't care who wins. And I yeah. literally just went, I was like, Roman's going to win. And then I literally looked at Ashley and I went, there's going to be three Superman punches, two spears <laughs> and a one-armed sit-out powerbomb. I was so close. You only hit one spear. <laughs> I was disappointed in that. But, um, you know, it, it was fun. And I think they tried to do the most with what they had. And I think that to, to, to give them credit, the fans in the stadium were really into it. You know, because, you know, straight from the off, they were they were out of the ring. They are brawling uh, outside. Um, and uh, they, they fought through the Minute Maid Park before they headed back towards the ringside area where Corbin choke slams Roman Reigns through the Spanish announce table. Um, but, um, you know, the fans seem to be really into it. So maybe it just came across better being there live as opposed to seeing it on the TV. Uh, they, they fought through the fans again for a second time, this time towards some equipment area. Um, this time Corbin... Um, he gets uh, dropped through a Chinese announce table. So uh, the, the foreign language announce tables weren't having a good time with things here, but he got dropped uh, with a Samoan drop from Roman Reigns through the table there. Both wrestlers uh, head towards uh, the technical area once again, where Reigns is ambushed by Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode, who kind of came from out of nowhere. Uh, then the Usos get involved, and there's to help neutralise the threat of Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler, I'm guessing. And there's one spot where Jim Uso, he did a huge dive uh, from, uh, from either the technical area from a nearby seating area um and uh, yeah down onto Ziggler and Brood down below so that was a pretty cool spot and uh, I think that one thing that WWE has always been second to none with is, is their kind of camera work and uh you know Jimmy Uso he, he did this dive completely out of nowhere completely out of the shot of the camera nobody knew it was it was going to happen until it happened and then that was a, a really big kind of wow moment um, then in true WWE fashion there has to be a little bit of toilet humour quite literally here with Roma Reigns throwing Baron Corbin into a port loo uh, which Reigns takes uh, great delight in turning over um, the match finally comes to an end with both wrestlers they fought near the, the, the stadium dugout where the two battled, but it was Roman Reigns who flattened King Corbin with a spear for the pinfall victory. So kind of, you know, in, in retrospect, thinking back, I'm sure it was a, a, a quite an entertaining match. There was a lot going on. Um, I'm sure unless you're watching it on the big screens in the stadium, you probably couldn't really see much of what was going on. But but the fans around the fight around, you know, where it's happening in the uh, in the stadium kind of really seemed into it. Um, I found it a little bit boring kind of watching it. Um, and I was, you know, it didn't really do it do too much t for me, probably because the two wrestlers have fought so many times before, and you kind of telegraphed how it was going to go. To be honest with you, um, and I thought some of the spots that happened, like the, the portal spots and things like that, you know, were a little bit childish. To be honest with you, uh, but Kieran, uh, you saw it as well as I did. Uh, give us give us your thoughts on uh, on this opening contest. The only credit I can give for WWE on this one is the inclusion of the Usos and. Obviously, for Robert Roode. The only problem I've got with it would be this feud is going to carry on. Uh, it's just long. Just, just do a le loser goes to Raw. Just get it over and done with. Go on. Just be <laughs> fine. Just, just get it over and done with. And then, I mean, the other thing I could give is they used the stadium well. I mean, the battling on top of the dugout was yep, good. That was good. Um, and I believe... Corbin got put through two announced uh, two foreign announced tables with Samoan drops as well. Right. Uh, from what I can remember, anyway, because I know he went through one because I called one, and then Roman picked off again, put it for a second. And I was like, uh, I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah. But apart from that, and the Jimmy spot, it was pretty much predictable. It's it's the same stuff you see, even on SmackDown. They do the same stuff on SmackDown. They're just trying to put each other through tables. It's yeah. boring. 
But when we've seen kind of fours count anywhere matches on, say, AEW or NXT or other promotions, they've been a lot more physical. They've been a lot more violent. Uh, but like I say, this was kind of a WWE version, a family friendly version of a of a fours count anywhere, you could say. And uh, there were some, you know, bright spots in it. Um, you know, let's be thankful that it wasn't the main event or going on last or for a championship. Uh, but it was what it was. Um, and Roman Reigns got the win there. And that, that led us straight into the women's Royal Rumble. So just to go through some of the, the highlights and I've kind of talked to Kieran throughout my kind of commentary to get his uh, take on what happened. But uh, uh, starting one and two was Alexa Bliss and Bianca Belair. Um, Bianca Belair and Alexa Bliss, they looked pretty dominant in this one uh, with the two fighting it out on the ring apron. Uh, that was until Bianca pulled uh, Alexa Bliss, who had hold of Bianca Belair's um, own hair extension, her braid, and pulled Alexa Bliss into the uh, the the ring uh, the ring post, sending her to the floor, eliminating Bliss. Uh, Mandy Rose was in the match. She was thrown over the top rope, only to land on top of um, Otis Dozovich, who was laying on the floor and was just just to ha- just so happened to be laying on the floor and caught Mandy Rose uh, to prevent her from being eliminated. That was a pretty fun moment. Uh, Charlotte Flair was out number seventeen. Um, uh, there was there was a moment where Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair. Still in there. Um, they they was dominating the match. They were throwing all the other competitors over the top rope. And then you had a bit of a face-off with just Flair and Bianca Belair in the ring um, all alone. Uh, Naomi uh, made her return after quite a long absence from the WWE. She came out at number 18 in front of her home crowd of Houston. Uh, Bianca Belair finally went out at the hands of Charlotte Flair after 33 minutes. And that was a really impressive outing from uh, Bianca Belair. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see her on a Raw or maybe a SmackDown fairly soon. I think her character is more kind of fitting towards, uh, you know, that that sort of product more fitting towards a Raw or a SmackDown. Although she's been excellent on NXT and we're going to see a bit of a at TakeOver Portland. I wouldn't be surprised to see her on one of those two bigger shows fairly soon. Uh, Beth Phoenix, she appeared to get her head smacked open or simply the back of her head uh, when I think she was punched by Bianca Belair when they were kind of up in the turnbuckles and whacked her head on the top or the edge of the ring post. And uh, that was bleeding quite profusely throughout the match, but she continued uh, and fought uh, the rest of the match. Shotzi Blackheart, I know a favourite of Kieran. Uh, she came out at number 26. And i uh, going to throw it over to you here, Kieran. When Shotzi came out, I know that you've mentioned on our Facebook page and uh, possibly one or two podcasts in the past, but a uh, big fan of Shotzi. And I bet you was uh, happy to see her in this match despite the fact she's only been with uh, NXT for a short while. It, it, it just shocks me because of all the people they could have put on there over Shotzi, they put Shotzi in. So I was like, yes, it just shows WWE have faith in younger talent. They're mm. finally starting to put over younger talent in main shows. And I think that's my biggest thing is WWE have a habit of focusing more on the old timers. So don't get me wrong, you know I love AJ, I love Randy Orton, but I think their feud that they had was a pointless feud. You could have had them, you could have had some of the younger guys come over, put them in a feud with the younger guys, and it would have given the younger guys a bit of name value, and it would have then gone and give other people a chance to express themselves and go against more experienced people. So to have Shotzi show up in the Rumble, uh, I think Dakota Kai showed up as well. Yeah. Tegan Knox. I don't think she did show up in the end. I can't remember. She did, yeah. Tegan came out yeah. next, uh, number 28, yeah. So this is what I mean. So they're actually giving younger people more time on their biggest shows, which is what they need. They yeah. need to have that ability to perform in front of 40,000 people. So when you have got the old timers gone, you've got the people that have got the previous experience. Building so WWE, stars, yeah. yeah. So WWE are now actually booking correctly instead of booking like crap like they have in the past. Yeah. And, and they've pushed Shotzi quite well on NXT. I know that uh, she eliminated Shani Baszler from the number one contenders battle world a couple of weeks ago. Then she had a, a match with, uh, did she have a match with Shayna or last week's NXT? Um, yes. But I know that she's getting a bit of a push. And although she's ended up on the losing end, the fact that she's on TV every single week in prominent feuds against uh, credible opponents demonstrates that they do have big plans for her. And, um, you know, she's got a great look. And I think that uh, you can imagine when she's on, on, you know, whether it be NXT, Raw, SmackDown, uh, you know, her her um, Shotzi 
figurine or her Shotzi t-shirts are going to sound really well because you know of her character and because of what she brings uh you know to to, to the party really but um she's an excellent wrestler and I think uh, she must have been absolutely buzzing to be part of the War Rumble but um you did mention Tegan Knox. Tegan Knox came out 20 I was really pleased to see her as part of the Rumble as well then we had Santina Santino Morella, uh, not Santino Morella, Santino Morella. Now, you may remember Santino, Santino's uh, alter ego, uh, won the all women's battle royal at WrestleMania 25, much to the chagrin of the other, uh, all the other female competitors during that match. But to be honest with you, uh, the, the female roster, the women's roster back then wasn't really much to shout about compared to what it is now. But this was just for comedic purposes. And Santina Morella promptly uh, uh, entered herself, himself, herself into the battle, into the Rumble, and then uh, eliminated herself from the Battle Royal, from the Royal Rumble. So uh, just a, a quick cameo there from uh, Santina. Uh, then Shayna Baszler came out number 30 to a really loud ovation, a great pop. Uh, she eliminated about six or seven wrestlers in really quick succession uh, she eliminated the likes of Carmella Tony Storm Naomi um with our final four, Kieran, well, it was down to Natalia, Beth Phoenix, Shayna Baszler and Charlotte Flair. So when we were down to the final floor, Natalia, Beth, Shayna and Charlotte, any kind of thoughts, any inklings, any wishes, any desires of, you know, who might be eliminated next or who might go on from uh, from the final four that stood in front of you? It, it kind of made sense the way they did it. But for me, it was nice to see Beth Phoenix and Natty. Yeah. as like teaming up again sure because they did that a lot in that rumble and i missed those two like when those two were like full heels going after pretty much every woman in the women's roster it was amazing you could mm. not fault that as what it was it made you intrigued who they're going to attack next stuff like that so it was nice to see a little bit of a flashback to that um the final two is obviously what everyone thought the final two was going to be yeah. The only issue was no one 100 percent knew who the winner was going to be. Very true. And obviously, as I said to you off air, it kind of made sense. But I'll go into that a bit more when we actually we reveal who the winner is. Yeah. So then, uh, to the surprise of a lot of fans and uh, those sitting at home as well, watching it on our TV screens, Beth Phoenix eliminated her so-called best friend, uh, Natalia, from uh, over the top rope from the Royal Rumble. Then we had the final three. Uh, Phoenix gets eliminated. We have the final two, just down to Shayna Baszler and Charlotte Flair. Um, and then Charlotte Flair manages to eliminate Shayna Baszler over the top rope by pulling Baszler over the top rope with her legs. Uh, to win the Women's Royal Rumble. Now, when you look at past winners, you've obviously had Asuka won the 2018 Royal Rumble, Becky Lynch won the 2019 Rumble. So it was it was inevitable that Charlotte was going to get a Royal Rumble victory um, one year or another. And I think she was a lot of people's kind of predictable favourite going into this one. So, yes, uh, Charlotte Flair won. I, 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 there were some boos. There were some boos from the from the crowd when uh, she did win because she's kind of, you know, very reminiscent of when Roman Reigns was getting his push and being shoved down our throats. And it sounds like, or it looks like they're doing the same with Charlotte Flair, to be honest with you. And uh, it doesn't just look like it now. They've been doing it for a long time. But I think Charlotte's possibly been a little bit more bearable uh, as compared to Roman Reigns. Um, um, but uh, yeah, she's kind of getting a bit of backlash for winning. She was quite emotional after the match. Uh, she grabbed the microphone and said, whether you wanted her to win or whether you wanted her to lose, she is a diamond cut to last forever. Um, now, I got hopeful, just as you got hopeful, when it was Shayna and Charlotte in the ring, hoping that Shayna Baszler would win. Uh, she was the bookmaker's favourite to go on and win the whole thing before the Rumble started. Um, and a lot of people thought, you know, she, she was very dominant. She eliminated seven uh, other women. But then it wasn't quite to be. And she had a really dominant uh, Survivor Series as well, where she closed the show, winning that triple threat main event um, at the back end of 2019. But it, it is quite promising and it is quite you know, hopeful with the fact that she was there at the very end, that they're looking to do something with her, possibly leading to WrestleMania. Uh, but give us your thoughts on the final two, the outcome, and what you think they could do with Shayna, possibly for WrestleMania. So I, so like we were discussing off, off, off the podcast yeah. before recording. Um, I think what they did was smart. This now gives the opportunity for Baszler to go to SmackDown. 
I know everyone wants to see Baszler versus um, Becky, but I think because everyone wants to see it, when it happens, people will buy more tickets. So I think the way they've done it is quite clever because they're making us want it more. You had a brief view of it, obviously, at Survivor Series, and people were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah. If you hold back, you wait, then do it, you're more likely to get the fans in more. Yeah. So I think the way they booked it was the right way to book it. Um, the only issue I have is you kind of got to give the fans what they want. And like you said, it's a very Roman Reigns feel at the minute yes. where Charlotte's getting shoved down our throats. Um, but she has been for years. And um, to be honest, there's not really much we can do about it. She's got the, she's equaled the women's title reigns now, or did she, no, she beat it? Yeah, I think she's 10 championships now. So the only way that they can make this really work is if she loses because she doesn't need 11. If she has 11, she's never going to get beat at the top, like, ever. I don't see mm. any woman in the current roster doing more than that. I think if Shayna gets the title, she'll go on to be one of the longest reigning women's champions. Mm. Um, but don't see her to... <sighs> I don't see Charlotte needing the 11 title reigns mm. yet. Yet. Obviously, she's still got quite a few years ahead of her. So it, it's going to happen. I just don't think it needs to happen yet. But so, so let, let me ask you this. I mean, currently Charlotte is part of the SmackDown roster. Um, so in theory, she I mean, she, she could potentially challenge for, for Bailey's championship because Bailey is the SmackDown women's champion. But having won the Royal Rumble, she gets her choice to choose between any of the female champions, whether it be Becky Lynch or Bailey. Which champion do you think she's going to um, challenge at WrestleMania? Unfortunately, we have the distinct honour of seeing Becky Lynch versus Charlotte, version 4,973. OK, OK. Uh, so I've got a theory about Shayna Baszler, and I don't think she'll be fighting for a championship at WrestleMania. I think that she'll have a match with Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania. How does that uh, theory, bit of fantasy booking sit with you? I, I'd like that. Don't get me wrong. MMA versus MMA. But my logic would be actually more Oscar. What, uh, Re- Shayna versus Oscar? Reason being, Oscar's the longest reigning women's champion. Baszler was the first two time NXT women's champion. Yep. You've got so, two of the most dominant NXT stars, put them together. They'd put on fire. They would yeah. put on fire. Bit of a ready made story there, but uh, it was quite an enjoyable rumble. I thought it got better. I really love the appearance of Shotzi Blackheart, uh, Tegan Knox. We didn't mention Mercedes Martinez. She was in there as well, um, having just recently signed a full-time contract with NXT. We had a, a brief appearance from uh, Chelsea Green, um, but uh, the women of the match has to go to Bianca Belair. She was in there for over 30 minutes. Uh, I think she eliminated eight wrestlers. Um, and um, and then, of course, Shayna Baszler. I thought Shayna Baszler looked really good in there, really dominant um, and should have won. Uh, but Charlotte won and it be interesting to see what they do with Charlotte leading to WrestleMania um, and who she does actually go up against. And then, speaking of the women's division, the next match was Bailey, current women's champion on the SmackDown brand, going up against Lacey Evans. So there was nothing really special to report about this match. To be honest with you, there was very little crowd reaction. The crowd were very quiet for this one. Uh, Bailey did win the match after bringing up her knees from a, a moonsault from Lacey. Uh, Bailey had a handful of tights to get the roll-up win, and then she retained her championship, essentially. So um, I think a lot of people were kind of hoping that Lacey might win. I think that they're possibly holding out and maybe giving Lacey a a bigger moment somewhere down the line, maybe a WrestleMania moment, dare I say it, Um, because I don't think the Bailey and the Lacey Evans feud is ending here, Uh, not with a loss uh, for for the babyface, that is. I think the babyface will always go over, and I think that big occasion, that, that big match, when she gets her moment with her daughter in the ring holding the championship high is possibly going to happen at WrestleMania. I could be completely wrong with that, but that could be the, the SmackDown Women's Championship match for WrestleMania uh, in Tampa Bay. But um, give us your quick thoughts on, on this one. Any kind of bright points, any positive points uh, from this one, or, or was it uh, pretty much as I said? Lacey Evans isn't ready for the big stage. Her styles, it's 
she's not fluent enough in the ring. Yeah. This this is just my opinion. I feel she's quite robotic when she wrestles. And it's always just the same sort of stuff. She gets beat up, she hits a woman's right and normally gets to pin. And Bailey as a heel is just as bad as she was as a baby face. Mm. It's like there's there's nothing there with Bailey. She's just bland, no matter what yeah. you do to her. I mean, when she first heel turned, yay, she got more mic time. She was a little bit better on the mic. But since she's done that, she's done nothing. Yeah. I it's think... been quite disappointing, really. It has been quite disappointing. It, it didn't live up to what we were all hoping for. It, it wasn't the Io Shirai heel turn um, that we were hoping for for Bailey. It certainly didn't happen that way. I think what's killed it is her joining with um, Sasha Banks. Yeah. Because it was literally just after Sasha returns. Sasha's got more of the heat of the return coming back. I think, for me personally... Bailey with Sasha's not good. Uh, I mean, they could always do Banks versus Bailey at Mania for, again, like the 12th millionth time. Yeah. If you go back, you see it at NXT, you see it at Raw, you see it at SmackDown, you see it on the main stage, exactly the same with Charlotte and Becky. And uh, I don't want to see that because it's, it's just boring. Mm. Okay, need... how about how about uh, Bailey versus Sasha versus Lacey? A bit of a triple threat, uh, triple threat match at Mania. It could spice things up a little bit. It could add a little bit more interest and intrigue being a triple threat. But it's what we're seeing every week. Yeah, on SmackDown, Bailey and it would literally just be Bailey and Banks take out Evans. They'll fight each other, and then Evans will come in with his rights. I want to pin. It's how they always do it when it comes to matches like that. Mm. And this is why I find WWE quite vanilla in their booking. It, it's predictable booking. They need my booking, but they won't do it. <laughs> or, or maybe to take things in a slightly different direction um, is to possibly have Shayna challenging Bailey, uh, which would be yeah. a fresh opponent, a fresh matchup, and uh, something new for the fans, and uh, potentially a new uh, dominant and interesting character that we haven't seen on either Raw or SmackDown, but as the new SmackDown Women's Champion after Mania. So that, that could be an interesting one, especially with Shenny getting such a strong show in, in the Rumble. I wouldn't be surprised if they potentially, if, they, if they're considering or thinking about maybe putting her against Bailey. Um, but then that would require either turning Shayna face or baby or baby back to her face you've got to have a heel baby face dynamic two heels against one another probably won't work unless you have Shayna as a tweener um but uh yeah it's gonna be very very interesting booking leading into uh wrestlemania that is for sure but let's talk about our next match then kieran the fiends uh bray wyatt uh, versus daniel bryan uh this is a strap match for the universal championship uh fiends going in as the current champion after the introductions were made um there was uh, they went to the outside pretty soon. They were both utilizing the 13 foot leather strap. Um, the Fiends uh, got the kind of advantage fairly early on by by whipping Daniel Bryan across the back and across the chest quite viciously. Uh, the Fiend hits a, a urinagi and a, a kind of a nap snack to Daniel Bryan. Bryan is quick to escape the sister Abigail getting a two count from a running knee. Uh, Daniel Bryan gets in some offense using the strap uh, as a weapon himself before nailing the fiend with a DDT um, on top of the German announce table. The table didn't break. Uh, Brian finally uh, starts to get the better of the fiend, um, but the champ, the fiend, is somehow able to hit a sister Abigail from out of nowhere with uh, Daniel Bryan kicking out on the on the two count. Um, the story of this match was that every time Daniel Bryan started to get some momentum, started to get the upper hand, the Fiend would recover and Daniel Bryan would seemingly have to start all over again with his offence. Um, this was the same as we come to the finish of the match as Daniel Bryan, uh, he connected with the running knee and then applied the yes lock using the, the leather strap across Bray's face. And even after all of that punishment, the Fiend uh, appeared to kind of jump back up to his feet, apply the mandible claw uh, one more time and uh, pins Daniel Bryan's shoulders to the mat for the one, two, three to retain his championship. So after the match, Daniel Bryan struggled back to the locker room, not wanting any help from any of the referees or the officials. I thought um, as far as the undercard matches were concerned, I thought this was uh, the best match of the night so far. But um, I think Daniel Bryan did as much as he could under the circumstances. I think that the, the, the strap match as a gimmick match was quite limiting, to be honest with you. I felt that it didn't really allow them to do as much as they probably ordinarily would be able to do in a one-on-one -on -one match. But they made it entertaining. Um, I must admit, I'm getting a little bit fed up of 
the fiends being kind of impervious to pain and kind of just jumping up no matter what sort of beating he's had previously um and uh, it, it kind of makes you think well where does this leave daniel bryan heading into wrestlemania if he's not part of a championship match in, in wrestlemania then you know there's no kind of ready built storyline or feud uh that's obvious at the moment but um give us your thoughts on the match and give us your thoughts on kind of where it might take these two individuals heading into mania so i think the match itself was solid. It told the story well. The weapons was used well. Uh, I kind of agree with you. Where why, why is the fiend just impervious to everything? It just seems pointless to me. You've got the fiend. He just takes a batter and then steps, just sits up. Yeah. Like obviously Taker used to do it, but when Taker did it, it was more towards the end of the match. Mm. It seems to be the and he used to sell taking a beating. Taker would sell getting beaten up. This guy takes a finish and just sits up like, what? Yeah. No. I mean, Hell in a Cell was the worst one for me for that. He got stomped like, what, 45,000 times? Oh, yeah. And uh, hit with a toolbox and ladders and all sorts. <laughs> and literally just stood up like, why? It's not necessary. Um, so I thought of a way that you could get the feed to take a pace in. He's done his sit up thing. And then he'll just take a pace in again. I'm going with either a triple threat or a fatal four-way at Mania. Right. Uh, triple threat would be Roman, Brian, Fiend. Okay, Fa- yeah. Fatal four-way would be Corbin, Brian, Roman, Fiend. Oh. So but then you, you stand could... a chance of Baron Corbin being universal champion at the end of it. You kind of... It, it's, yeah, it's... but <laughs> it, it's, it's going to happen at some point anyway because Vince McMahon absolutely loves the guy. So, for me, you're going to put him on the big stage. Because let's face it, at the minute, he's one of your bigger names on SmackDown. So, you get him on the big stage. You have put you put him in there with three people that have all had major WrestleMania moments. So, he can only learn from the experience. Yeah. And this is, this is what I mean by WWE developing their wrestlers. Yeah, like aims for the future, yeah. Yeah, so you, you put him in there with the three veterans that you've got there, all with their WrestleMania moments. And it's a good way then to have all three people gag up on The Fiend and take him out of the match. Mm. At least that way, if he retains the title, you're not so shocked. And then not everyone gets what we all know is going to happen, which is going to be Roman versus The Fiend. Because for me, Roman versus The Fiend isn't a really a match I want to see. Because... It's it's predictable, and you know if it happens that somehow Roman's going to come away with a title. Where if you make it a triple threat or a fatal four way, there's a shock there. Yeah. So the whole idea of WrestleMania is to build anticipation for it. Yeah. If you've got Brock versus Drew as your main event on the Raw side of things, you need something equally as good on the other side. Yeah. And I think the only way you're going to get that is through a fatal four way. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting anyway, but um, yeah, we shall see. I think the only way to, to kind of pin the fiends, we, we, they need to kind of get the, the forklift truck out like they've used in matches in the past. Was it a halftime heat or something where, uh, oh, mankind, yeah. where the rock pinned mankind or one of them underneath the pallet and, uh, yeah. get, you know, well, you know, or something. <laughs> get uh, get the big show to sit on him. I don't know. I don't uh, think they'd they do that anymore. <laughs> I'd love to see it, but I don't think they'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we went into Becky Lynch versus Asuka for the Raw Women's Championship. Of course, uh, um, uh, when roles were reversed 12 months ago, you had uh, Asuka. I believe she was the SmackDown Women's Champion at the time as she defeated Becky Lynch. And going into this match, the storyline was that uh, Asuka is the one woman um, that Becky's not been able to get the better of. Um, in this match, um, Asuka took a nasty bump on the outside from a, a face first uh, suplex from off the ring apron down onto the floor. She appeared to hurt her arm when that happens. Um, Asuka, she did kind of get her own back and put in several really stiff kicks it was uh you know good to see Asuka getting some really good kicks in there on Becky um Asuka took a lot of punishment on her arm throughout this match uh, while Becky was taking a real beating as she was being pummeled with uh, Asuka's really stiff kicks the end of the match happened when Asuka shoved Becky into the corner trapping the referee at the same time Asuka saw this as an opportunity to hit Becky with her green mist uh, but Becky was quick to react she kicked 
Asuka in the stomach before applying her disarmor, causing Becky uh, Asuka to tap out. And the man, Becky Lynch, retained her championship in a pretty good match. It was it was a good match, um, and uh, th- there was some you know some solid action between these two with Asuka putting in a really good shift um, and uh, some stiff kicks along the way. But the outcome. As we've said so many times already tonight, the outcome was fairly predictable and it looks like Lynch will be going to WrestleMania. Um, but um, who will she be facing? We mentioned earlier that Charlotte, uh, the, the, predi- the predictable match might be Charlotte versus Becky. Um, but uh, we shall see. We shall see. That 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 is yet to be seen. Any thoughts on this match? Um, I thought it was a good match. I thought that Asuka put in a good shift and I think they had to really show Asuka is quite dominant because the story going into it was Asuka was the only one that Becky has not been able to get the better of um but um yeah uh I, you know I see Asuka and Curry saying defending their tag team championships at Wrestlemania so I don't think all is lost as far as that's concerned I think they will be kind of taking some gold into Wrestlemania whether they'll be taking the gold out of Wrestlemania is a uh, you know we'll have to see um but um Becky overcame and um I thought it was a good match but what about yourself Kieran uh again this is not one of those matches I had not a lot of interest in just my personal opinion we yeah because I wanted Oscar to go over just so it frees up so it fresh for Mania. Yeah. And then when it didn't happen, I was just like, yeah, I know where this is going. So it, it, it's one of those things where I think my fantasy booking kind of just changed my opinion on things. And because I don't want to see Becky versus Charlotte, I don't want to see Charlotte versus Bailey. I don't want to see Becky versus Bailey. <laughs> I don't, because we've seen it all so much. You're just yeah. recycling the same stuff. And there's only so many times you can see a match before you go, yeah, I can call every single spot that's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. We've seen so... any combination of them four, haven't we? Sasha, Bailey, Charlotte, and, and Becky, uh, you know, a hundred times over. But um, yeah, I, I think, it, you know, this one was predictable because we knew that, um, as we said, the story going into it was Becky's not been able to get the better of Asuka based yeah. off of her loss to Asuka from, from 12 months ago. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're still pushing Asuka quite hard as, as the heel and the green mist. Um, but uh, this is the first time that somebody has not been sprayed with the green mist. In fact, in fact, I think Asuka actually sprayed herself with green mist, which, which was quite yes. a, a good, good visual at the end of the match with her face all covered in green uh, while she was being kind of, uh, you know, comforted by Kyrie saying her tag team partner and uh, Becky looked pretty dominant. I think it makes sense to have her after such a, you know, such a momentous main event at WrestleMania last year where she won that triple threat. She was Becky two bouts, to, you know, the first women's main event of a WrestleMania. I think it makes sense for her to you know, retain the championship going into WrestleMania this time round, so that she can kind of see the story through full circle. Um, and I think that's where Charlotte comes in, into it as well, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it was nice to see that, you know, that the, the utilizing Asuka more whether she wins or whether she loses it's nice to see that she's um you know on tv every single week she's the tag team champions yeah we'd all like her to be uh you know small smackdown or raw champion but uh, I, I don't think they have that in their plans at all now to be honest with you at all no but you never know they, they flip on a dime all the time so yeah you know yeah. what they like yeah well, uh, I'm waiting for, for Kyrie Sane to turn on Asuka. Uh, because when you think about it, WrestleMania is in Tampa, isn't it? It's all about, you know, the, 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 the Buccaneers, the Pirates, the Pirate Ship. And she needs to bring out a kind of baby face pirate character for WrestleMania. That can only happen, I think, if she's going up against Asuka. Or maybe, you know, pulling out the pirate gimmick one last time to defend their tag team championships. But uh, that'll be so, quite fun. That has to happen. So for that to happen, it would have to be Asuka turn on her... So maybe yeah. there'll be a title loss coming up, maybe. Good point. We've we still got one more pay-per-view to go over. We've still got Elimination yeah. Chamber where they could potentially lose their championships. But uh, enough about Asuka and Kyrie Sane and Becky. Let's talk about the men's War Rumble. So this is... 
this is the main event. This is the last match. Um, and probably the highlight of the whole show, to be honest with you. Uh, now, I couldn't have been the only person that thought Booker T was entering himself into the Royal Rumble when his music played at the start of the match. But no, he was just kind of, he was, he was uh, trolling the fans. Um, he's a Houston, Texas native, and he was going to be commentating for this match. But uh, I did get quite hyped. I thought that, because there was a lot of rumours and Booker's been working out. There's been then photos of him training and looking quite pumped. And I thought Booker was uh, entering himself into the rumble but no uh, of course Brock Lesnar comes out number one Elias comes out num- number two but uh, he soon eliminates uh, Elias after cracking Elias over the back with his own guitar that looked uh, pretty painful uh, Brock doesn't waste any time in eliminating the likes of Eric Rowan Robert Roode John Morrison uh, who came out number five uh, things got a little more, little bit more interesting when Kofi came out at number six, followed by Rey Mysterio at number seven. They were soon joined by Big E, who dropped Lesnar with the, the big ending. Uh, Ray hit his uh, 619 on Brock, uh, but Brock takes no prisoners and quickly eliminates Ray, uh, Big E and Kofi, all before the number nine entrant came out. So uh, then we get MVP as the first legend. Um, any thoughts on MVP? He's been do- he's still active, still working on the Indies. Uh, he looked pretty good here um, and uh, he got quickly eliminated, but uh, got quite a good pop. Any thoughts on MPV's uh, MVP's appearance in the Rumble? I kind of saw it happen. So um, I was talking to a couple of guys and they were showing me this stuff on Twitter and Instagram uh, saying that he did come up. So I was like, "Ah, oh, okay." He was in the area. So, yeah. So I kind of had a feeling he was going to pop up. So when he did, it was kind of like, yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense. And apparently he's... um, uh... He's a full-time talent on the Raw roster as well. I believe he was on Monday Night Raw last night. So uh, that'd be interesting to see what happens there. But um, he was brought out as a as a special attraction, as a legend, I suppose. Then uh, Keith Lee came out uh, to a huge pop. I certainly jumped out of my chair when he came out. Uh, he was one that wasn't announced prior to the Rumble, but a lot of people suspected that he would be in, in the Rumble. He dropped Lesnar with a big shoulder barge. Uh, both men um, go down with double clotheslines. Then Braun Strowman comes out at 15, but after a brief brawl between Keith Lee and Braun Strowman, um, Brock dumps both big men over the top rope and out of the Rumble. Then many people's odds on favourite to win the Rumble, Drew McIntyre came out number 17. Um, then in the shock of the night, uh, Ricochet nails Brock with a low blow from behind. This allowed McIntyre to hit a claymore kick to the current WWE champion Brock Lesnar, sending him sailing over the top rope. Now, that was a really awesome moment, a good bit of payback for Ricochet after being uh, dropped with an F5 on Raw last week. And Drew McIntyre, a lot of people had him pegged as the favourite. I think he was possibly the bookies' favourite going into this as well. But he eliminated the very, very dominant Brock Lesnar after 30 plus minutes of being in the Rumble with a Claymore kick over the top rope. So you must have popped when this happened, when uh, Ricochet got involved uh, with a low blow and then McIntyre put a nail in the coffin for Brock, sending him sailing with a Claymore. So happy. I couldn't have been happier when that happened because uh, as much as it was nice to see Brock being dominant and eliminating everyone, there was a few people that entered where I was like, why, why, why? Because, like, Rowan came in. Rowan came in and Brock eliminated him straight away. I was like, why? You've built Rowan as, like, this massive powerhouse that's wiping through people. He's entered the rubble and Brock's eliminated him in, like, 10 seconds. You've just killed all momentum you've given him. Um... So, yeah, when Brock went, because I I said before the show started that for me it was going to end one of two ways. So Drew was either going to eliminate him or Brock was going to win and Punk was going to come down at the end. Right. And so when Drew eliminated him, I was like, yeah, that's mainly sorted. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's, that's just me. And I, I look forward to that match, to be honest, because I, I know for a fact Brock ain't going to be able to throw, out, throw around Drew like he throws around other people. So, because uh, Drew, Drew will just know, so. 
Yeah, I mean, I had it down here that, that Brock was in the Rumble for close to 30 minutes. I think he eliminated 13 wrestlers. Uh, McIntyre then eliminated Ricochet. Uh, then number one came out, uh, number 21 came out, and that was Edge. Uh, nobody thought that he would ever return to the ring after his triple um, fuse and neck surgery um, that happened after he retired in 2011. Um, he looked amazing, got a tremendous pop from the crowd. In fact, it wasn't just a pop, it, it took the, took if there was a roof on the stadium, it took it off, but uh, it was a pretty huge evasion for Edge um, definitely one of the kind of the moments of the whole night he gave uh, spears to everybody in the ring uh, we had a bit of a stare down between Edge and AJ Styles and the fans were really the fans were really into this moment so a real mark out moment but when Edge came out Kieran um, I, I bet the place you were you know watching the rumble in went crazy didn't it uh, there was a lot of his entrance music son a lot yeah it was it, it was <laughs> it was amazing because for me, for having Edge return, obviously he'd been online denying it, like completely denying that he was returning. And then just before the Royal Rumble match, I saw something on Facebook, which was a picture of Beth Phoenix. And it said underneath it, hey, Adam, I've got a babysitter today. What do you want to do? And then he came out and I was like, ah, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it's, it's a huge moment to see him come back. And then it looks like they've set up his WrestleMania feud already with what happened on Raw. So, yeah, we'll talk about that in a bit. But that was a huge moment. Uh, then Matt Riddle came out at number 24. He was quickly eliminated by King Corbin. Now, we were speaking a little bit off air about Matt Riddle. And I think I was most disappointed um, by the fact that Matt Riddle was almost, you know, he, he just didn't seem very special in this match at all. He was kind of jobbed to uh, King Corbin just within moments of, of being entered into the match um, at number 24. But uh, I know that there's been reports online saying that he had some sort of verbal altercation with Brock Lesnar, of course. Um, his uh, verbal altercation with uh, Goldberg made an episode of uh, 24, I think the, the Goldberg special, um, and uh, on the WWE Network. And, you know, I think Matt Riddle's getting a little bit of a, a bad reputation for just uh, shooting off his mouth a bit too much uh, when he should really just be knuckling down and concentrating on his character, concentrating on his wrestling. Um, but I think he sh his backstage shenanigans is getting himself into a little bit of trouble. And I think that could explain possibly why he got jobbed out at the Survivor Series and he got jobbed out again here. What would you say? It, yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah, he's... <sighs> He's getting himself a very bad reputation when he doesn't need to. He's too braggadocious. He thinks that he can absolutely annihilate everyone and stuff like that. When really, if WWE don't want you to go over, you're not going to go over. And you're not helping yourself at the minute yeah. with the way you're acting around some of the people that are legends. Because yeah. they are legends in this company. So... If they've got a choice to put you over of them, they're always going to go with them if you're going to keep being an idiot. Yeah. You've, so, got, you've got to do things the right way, WWE. Otherwise, they won't take you seriously and they'll just see you as a troublemaker and just won't use you or get rid of you. It's as simple as that. I've got a feeling that because WWE always gives someone to Super Strong Style 16 for progress, that they'll give Matt Riddle just so he's away <laughs> for a bit because he's, lit he's literally just causing himself more harm than it's worth. Yeah. I don't get me wrong. I love the I love the guy. Same here. I think he's I think he's an awesome wrestler, but he's just being an idiot. Yeah. But yeah. It, it is what it is. He needs to knuckle down. If he doesn't knuckle down, it won't surprise me if he gets released. Because yeah. I mean, if if they're giving him, him these way. opportunities, Kieran. They're giving him opportunities. You know, they put him in the uh, the you know, team NXT for uh, Survivor Series, and here again. Um, of the Rumble. So, they, so on one hand, they are giving him opportunities and they do see a lot of promise in him and they do want to use him. But on the other hand, they're kind of, you know, jobbing him out or he's not looking very special when he is uh, there um, and being eliminated or thrown over the top rope very, very quickly. And, you know, part of that does kind of part of me does think, well, is that because of his personality that he's robbing people up the wrong way? And uh, it kind of my instinct tells me, yes, that's why he's he's being jobbed out so quickly these sort of matches yeah and i agree i 100 yeah. agree he he's he's rubbing the wrong people up the wrong way yeah like if he did it with someone like keith lee or something like that keith lee would just laugh it off but because you're doing it to the big stars you you're just putting yourself in the limelight of being a dick yeah 
and exactly. it just it it doesn't go well for the company, and that is why he's being jobbed out on these big shows. Mm. Uh, and then we move on. Roman Reigns came out number 26. Uh, Kevin Owens came out 27, dropping both Roman and Randy Orton with stunners. Uh, Alistair Black comes out next, uh, drops everybody with black masses. That was a pretty cool moment, uh, giving him a little bit of shine in that match. Seth Rollins comes out number 30, along with uh, AOP and uh, Buddy Murphy in tow. Uh, kind of there's a big brawl at ringside. Um, Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe, they get dumped out by Rollins. Uh, then the final five in the match, Seth Rollins, Randy Orton, Drew McIntyre, Roman Reigns and Edge. Uh, the four faces appear to gang up on the Monday Night Messiah. Um, Edge eliminates Orton and nearly gets eliminated himself uh, by the big dog. Uh, but it's uh, Roman Reigns who gets uh, uh, who gets uh, gets rid of Edge if I can get my words out properly. Then it's down to the final two, Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns, and to the delight of everybody in the Minute Maid Park, and I'm sure to the delight of Kieran and myself and everybody uh, watching on TVs around the world, it's Drew who tosses Roman over the top rope to win the 2020 Royal Rumble. So I think Drew McIntyre was at the top of everybody's wish list to win the Men's Royal Rumble this year. But I think... You know, that was our head versus our heart. And I think our heart was saying Drew, but our head was saying Roman. And so we had those two as the final two. And we were thinking, oh, no, they're going to they're gonna troll us. They're going to, you know, tease us with a Drew win and then get Roman over or Roman to uh, eliminate Drew at the last second. But that didn't happen. And they actually gave the fans what they wanted, which is something the WWE is not famous for doing. But they did give the fans what they wanted on this occasion. And Drew McIntyre... Uh, won the match and he looked emotional he looked delighted he pointed at the Wrestlemania sign and he's going on to main events Wrestlemania so uh, it, that was you know on top of Edge coming out and Keith Lee being there and uh, Brock being dominant uh, this was another massive highlight from the Men's Royal Rumble match but uh, give us your thoughts on what went down here then Kieran uh, absolutely loved it uh, one thing we didn't touch on with, with Edge's entrance is if you look he takes a second he mm. looks like he's about to cry. Yeah, and really takes I, it in. Yeah. I, I loved that. I love. I love when you see people that return where they let their emotions draw them in. I he think he never that's thought it was going to happen, did he? He never thought he was ever going to, you know, step foot inside a wrestling ring ever again, and and he did. Um, which is incredible. And, he, he, you know, with Daniel Bryan coming back from retirement, Edge coming back from retirement, he does give hope to wrestlers. You know, if Steve Austin came back from several neck surgeries, you know, there's Paige on the sidelines. I'm sure she'd love to get back into the ring. But it proves that with the right, you know, the, the right medical help, the right surgery, the right uh, rehabilita- rehabilitation, he can come back. And I think um, Edge kind of surprised himself and he was over the moon and very emotional to be back on Sunday night. But yeah, that was a hell of a moment. It really was. Can we just talk about how ripped Edge was as well? Oh yeah, he looked pretty good. (laughs) He he was ripped. For someone that's not actually had to do any competing for nine years, he was ripped. I was like, Damn, he looked. He, he looked better than his final run in 2011. Yeah. That's for sure. He looked so much. But he had a dad bod uh, back then. But yeah. uh, no, he, he looked. He looked. Uh, he looked pretty good. Of course, you know he's um, starring in Vikings, a TV series, and various, uh, you know, various um, movies. Um, but um, yeah, he, he looks fantastic. And um, not quite sure if the, if the if the facial hair really suits him. But um, yeah, he's got a, he's got a good look. Yeah. Back to the original question because I sidetracked and I apologise. So, um, yes, Drew, Drew winning. Yes, I'm happy for this because Drew's one of those people where. So he was brought in. He was brought in as the chosen one by Vince McMahon. And it never really amounted to anything. He was Intercontinental Champion and then that was about it. And then he went away. He honed his craft in New Japan, TNA ring of honor he went he traveled the globes he got a name for himself bam comes back and he's one of those people where you know it's a success story mm. so first time around wwe were like yeah yeah we don't like you blah 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 he went and he was like do you know what fair enough watch what i do now and he went and did it yeah. he's proof that if you've got a drive and you've got a focus you can do what you want to do. So, a lot of respect to the guy. I uh, like I see I saw Drew at 
Planet Ice and Milton Keynes with Defiant. I saw him like he's huge. He's a big boy. See, so, six five, six six. He's, a, yeah. he's up there, isn't he? Yeah. So he's that stereotypical big guy that WWE liked. But if you look at recent history, it's not what who they've been pushing. True. Otherwise, Broad would be like a four thousand nine hundred seventy-three <laughs> time world champ by now. So yes. it, it it just proves that WWE aren't going for the stereotypical thing. Yeah. And I think the bit I like the most about Drew is that he got pulled up to the main roster and he didn't get put straight in the main picture. They built him up. They built it. Yeah. I, I don't like it when they when they bring someone straight up straight into the main event picture because then after that you've not really got much to do with them I mean look at Kevin Owens Kevin Owens came up as NXT champ and took on Cena straight away biggest name in your company you can't get bigger than that you can't push him anymore than that yeah. so I think they went about it the right way with Drew I know there was a few ups and downs in the middle with his injuries and stuff but honestly with Drew I think they've done it the right way and I'm glad yeah. Because I'm, I think th- I'm looking forward to Mania just for that match. Yeah, there's many upsides to Drew, and we, we've said this for a long time. And this was a lot of the stuff he worked on when he was out of the picture, working the Indies, working the Impacts and the Ring of Honours. Um, but he worked on his promo skills and his look and, you know, his image. And he kind of developed himself. He built himself into the Drew McIntyre that he always wanted to be. And he built himself into the total package. And now he looks fantastic. He speaks fantastically. He's, he's probably one of the best promo guys in the company. Um, and he's, he, you know, that Claymore kick is second to none. is pretty damn special, but he, he, he can definitely move around that ring for a big guy. Um, and he's got, you know, 10 years more experience than when, you know, he was the chosen one. So all of that combines you know, it gives you um, a pretty special commodity, to be honest with you. And um, yeah, he's gone out there, he's proved himself, he's come back and he's, he's, he's proved to the bosses in WWE that all that hard work um, needs to be recognised and it has been recognised, it has paid off and he won the Royal Rumble. Uh, so fantastic. So, um, you know, it's looking likely that he will take on Brock Lesnar because he eliminated Brock Lesnar. It kind of makes sense storyline wise. Um, so that could be a hell of a match. You know, the question is, you know, is he going to get the, uh, you know, the typical WrestleMania treatment and lose to Brock, or are they going to put him over? Uh, do you think? Do you think? Do you think they'll put him over? Do you think they'll push the button uh, on Drew at Mania? They need to, because you're making your main title irrelevant. And I've said this on many podcasts in the past. I think if you listen to the last four podcasts I've done with you, I've said the exact same thing. Brock as champ is devaluing your title. Like, big time devaluing your title. You've got pretty much Andrade is your main event champion because Mm -hmm. he's the only one you've got there every week. And now he's gone for a month. What are you going to push? Your tag belts? Do you get what I mean? It's it's, You're killing your own brand's big title so you need someone who's a full timer to do it and you need to give Drew his Wrestlemania moment so it makes perfect sense but then in the same breath it's WWE it's yeah it's quite reminiscent of when you know when they uh, you know pushed a button on people like Batista back in the mid 2000s and they kind of built him and built him and then gave him his WrestleMania moment and he won the championship. It's very reminiscent to when, you know, they've done it time before with with the likes of Randy Orton when they've built Triple H and, you know, where they've they've they said, right, this is the year. This is this guy's year and this is, you know, gonna be their WrestleMania. So it's very reminiscent of when they've done that before. Um but yeah, they do like swerving the fans. They do like, you know, pulling pulling the plug on our dreams and our desires. Um, but uh, they, you know, they've, they've delivered on occasions. You know, Daniel Bryan in 2014, they gave us that moment, and hopefully in 2020 in Tampa, April the fifth, WrestleMania, they'll give us our a kind of moment again for Drew because uh, that will be the popular result most definitely. But um, there we go. Listen, Kieran. That brings us uh, close to the end of the, the, the Royal Rumble review. Before we go, what, what were some of your kind of highlights, some of your, your takeaway memories from this year's Royal Rumble then, buddy? I like, I absolutely loved 
the fact that Drew won the Rumble. I think it was about time. So for me, that was amazing. Uh, Keith Lee popping up, absolutely fucking brilliant. Yep. Sorry, swearing, my bad. Um, Edge's return, again, like I said, I think the fact that you got to see his emotion as well really drew me in. Yeah. And it was nice to be able to sing his entrance music again. Mm-hmm. Um, apart from that, for me, the, the show was kind of taboo and predictable. I mean, the final four for the Women's Rumble again, absolutely brilliant choices. Mm-hmm. I think they could have gone slightly different ways with it. But again, it's WWE. They pay people money to book terrible things. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for me, yeah. It is It is what it is. We take away from the shows what we take away from the shows. And we already know we've got the epic main event match of Drew McIntyre versus Brock Lesnar, which I think is going to be amazing. It is, yeah. I mean, some of the, uh, you know, shining moments for me, really enjoyed Bianca Belair in the Women's Royal Rumble um, and, and Shayna's kind of dominance towards the end there. Just a shame that she didn't win the whole thing. Uh, Lights. Brock being very dominant for the first 30 minutes of the Men's Royal Rumble. I think that, that was pretty cool. Uh, Keith Lee looked good in the short time that he was there. Edge's return, uh, the, the out of this world pop. Uh, and uh, I certainly marked out from my armchair at home. Drew McIntyre eliminating Brock Lesnar and then going on to win the whole thing. That was really, really special. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was a, a pretty solid show, but it will be the Rumble matches uh, out of all of it that I'll remember kind of uh, when you kind of look at it all from top to bottom. The, the undercard matches weren't anything really to write home about. They're pretty predictable and uh, not very special. But uh, the Rumble matches, I thought, were pretty good. But uh, there we go. Um, Kieran, if any of our Wrestling With Jonas uh, podcast listeners want to say hi, get in touch with you. I know you've got a, an Instagram page, uh, which kind of um, is a journal for all of your wrestling trips and all your wrestling related uh you know uh blogs uh but um tell us about your instagram page and anywhere else our listeners can get in touch with you and say hi so what i'll do is because i've changed the name recently and i can't remember what i've changed it to (laughs) so what i'll do is i'll share a link to it when this podcast drops yeah and i'll add it underneath it if that's okay with you yeah, absolutely fine. So we'll uh, just put it in the comments to the, the post um, and I'll, I'll uh, even add it to the description of the podcast so uh, other people will be able to find out what it is uh, when they kind of visit the podcast and look at the description. But uh, yeah, just uh, drop a link to the Instagram in the comment to the post and uh, that'd be pretty cool. But um, of course, you'll um, always present on the Jonna's Facebook page of course always, um, always so if you want to kind of get in touch with Kieran that way you can do um, but it's been great talking to you again buddy and it's been really nice talking to you about the Royal Rumble uh, a good show all in all um, and I think uh, definitely kind of a thumbs up for me definitely for the for the bright spots and the uh, kind of big moments that happens but um, would you say it's a thumbs up show or somewhere in the middle how would you my, kind of my, rate my, it? Fu- my thumbs about halfway up it would be just in the middle yeah. if it wasn't for Drew's win yeah. But like we've said, the majority of the matches were predictable. Cool. And so, yeah, it, it's, it wasn't eye-popping for me. Like I said, biggest moments, Edge's return and stuff. I think the bit that annoyed me the most is the biggest thing I wanted didn't happen. So, yeah. which was Punk's return. But yeah. There we go. Well, it makes you wonder whether we'll ever get that at all, to be honest with you, especially after not seeing him on Sunday. But maybe he'll see out his, his contract with uh, Fox and then um, and then be a bit of a free agent, for want of a better word, so that he can wrestle uh, without being under contract to a major TV firm. But uh, there we go. Kieran, um, going to have to leave uh, your thoughts for another day. We'd love to get you back on the podcast sometime very, very soon. So thanks for helping us out with uh, this week's episode of Wrestling with Jonas. And please keep it tuned to the Wrestling with Jonas podcast for all of your weekly NXT. NXT and AEW updates, WWE and AEW pay-per-view reviews, exclusive interviews, and so much more. And if you've enjoyed listening to the podcast, please don't forget to spread the word, tell your friends and tell your family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wrestling Majonis podcast on all of our social media pages and to our podcast channels so you don't miss out on a single episode. Uh, in the meantime, don't forget to check out our website, wrestlingwithjohnners.com, and uh, have yourself a, a great week. Thanks again to Kieran, and we'll catch up with you all again soon. 